and today and next week we will be talking about information design and this is a in full contrast to matching this is a very new field so it really blew up in the past 10 years there are no really good uh, textbooks on it there are I've seen no good service even. So while for, for dynamic mechanisms we use this uh, great survey by uh, Bergman and Bellinacki, and I think it's, it, it covers the topic uh, very well. For uh, information design, I put two surveys into, into the literature list. So there is one survey by Kaminica, who actually is um, probably the main reason why this literature blew up. And the uh, second one is the survey by Bergman and Morris. And they basically covered two approaches to this information design. But I would say that none of them maybe presents the, the, the material in a perfect way. So they, are, they cover two slightly different approaches and both are biased towards their own approach. But before we go that deep, that deeply into, uh, into discussing who did what and how did they did it, how did they do it and why they did it differently, Let's talk about what exactly is information design. So what is, what will we be doing this uh, in this, these next two weeks? So let's, uh, let's start by recalling this first diagram that we draw, that we drew in our course. So the setting of environment, mechanism, uh, outcome, and so on. So when we compared mechanism design, when we connected it to game theory, now we'll use the same diagram to connect mechanism design to information design. And this diagram looked like this. So we say that there is this outer layer, the big environment that we are operating in. And it tells us that what players we are dealing with, what do they know, so what are their types, data, so what do they know about their own preferences, and what they know about other players' preferences. And finally, uh, the utility functions the actual preferences of players. Within this environment, which is fixed, we are designing our mechanism, which says, well, what is the game that our players will be playing? And this mechanism in general prescribes actions and some choice rule G that maps actions, so what players did, into what outcome we will implement as the designer. So outcome is in there, it is the result of running our mechanism. And in, most often we treat our outcome as some kind of real allocation k and some set of transfers for all agents t. Sometimes we do not have one or the other, but this is the, the, the average kind of thing. And we're doing all of that in order to achieve some goal, more often than not. So we have some social choice rule f, which says that, well, for this type profile, we would like to implement this allocation. For this type profile, we would like to implement this allocation. And we would like to implement this social choice rule. So the evaluation of, of the mechanism is whether our outcome produced by the mechanism in our environment corresponds to the goal that we set. So if it does, we, if we say that we have implemented the social choice function, otherwise we say we don't. Now, this is not universal. Uh, for example, in optimal mechanisms, we do not have any particular goal in terms of social choice function, but rather we have an objective function that we're trying to maximize, the designer's utility function. And there, so we do not care about implementing some particular social choice function. So, in mechanism design, our environment is fixed, and we're choosing this mechanism. In information design, we flip this to some extent. So we say that the game that the players play is fixed. But we can design some aspects of the environment. In particular, we can choose what information the players get. So we can basically design their type spaces. We can design what kind of information they get about their own preferences and about others' preferences. So you would probably ask, it, it sounds silly. Why would I not know my own preferences? Well, the answer is you would not know your own preferences because they depend on something that you don't know, right? Uh, I should have prepared an example for that. Let's say I, I, 
I, I want to go to the beach tomorrow in December. Yeah, but I do not know what the weather will be. I do not know whether it will be sunny or it will be as usual. So my preferences depend on this unknown state of the world. But I do not know the state of the world. So some designer, the weather forecast, can uh, design what information I get about the state of the world and therefore about my own preferences. So this is basically the main interpretation that we will take today. And we'll say there is some state of the world and we're designing what information players get about it. So this slide is basically these, these paintings in text. But it says pretty much the same thing. In mechanism design, we fix, have fixed information and outcomes, and we choose the game. In information design, we have fixed the game, and we select the information. Oh yeah, the alternative name by which information design often goes is Bayesian persuasion. So this is just another moniker that is often used. So if you hear it sometime, this is more or less the same thing. But they, they relate to these two different approaches that, that exist in the literature that we will see later on. So. This is the general environment that we'll be working in. We have some state of the world, Omega, initially unknown to everyone. So the players do not know it, and the designer does not know it either. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But everybody uh, has some common prior about this state of the world, Phi Zero. We have, as usual, some set of players. In general, you can think of many players, but we will mostly be talking about the settings with one player. Just like in, in optimal mechanisms, this is more or less enough to identify the main trade-offs that arise um, in, in this model. And we say that at some point in the game, each player will have to choose an action. So there is some game that all of the agents play. They have action sets. Uh, they, each player has some utility function, which depends on the actions that everybody chose and the state of the world. So, as we discussed. And both action sets and the utility functions are fixed in the environment. So we are, to be very explicit, we are no longer designing the action sets. We are now given some game and we must play it. The designer's objective function is uh, some v0, which also in general depends on the whole action profile and the state of the world. And uh, we will we will not be looking at the analog of this problem of implementing some given social choice rule, we will straight away, once again, jump to these kind of optimal informational mechanisms. So we will be looking at mechanisms that maximize this V0. And the object of choice for the designer is what we will call an experiment. An experiment is uh, just some communication strategy, so which maps states into distributions of messages for every player. So M is some set of messages, also in general part of, part of something that you can design. M to the power N means that we, we give a message to every player, and then we take a distribution over that. The, the way that you can think about this problem is to say that your state, omega, now, or in information design, is similar to the types of players, to the profile of types in the mechanism design problem. And the difference is, now we start with players not knowing any of these, but we can reveal through this experiment uh, either player's own type or some information about others' types. So, But we will talk more about what this experiment means and how, how we can interpret the setting overall. Or alternatively, you can think that yeah. players' state of mind after receiving this message prescribed by the experiment is the player's type. Because then this state of mind will characterize whatever everything that player knows about their own preferences and about everybody else's preference. So what is this experiment? What is this communication strategy? What is this mapping from states into the distributions of messages? Well, it is some some informative signal about the state. So here are some examples of that. One experiment that you can do is to say, well, 
I will send everybody the perfectly revealing signal about the state. Meaning, I will basically tell every player what exactly the state is. And we are kind of thinking that we can generate any information we want. We can run any experiment we want, and uh, we will not be punished for it. So there is no cost of running more informative experiments uh, or anything like that. So we can choose any information we want. But there is also separate literature which deals with kind of costly information. So information acquisition problems or uh, rational inattention problems and everything like that. So these are not those problems. Perfectly revealing signals is one example. Uh, pulling signals is another example. So for example, if your state of the world is just a number, like the temperature tomorrow, then one experiment we can design is uh, some pooling experiment which will pull intervals of numbers. So an experiment which tells us whether the temperature tomorrow will be above or below 5 degrees is this kind of example of pooling uh, signal. Now partially informative signals are a very broad term, so the, the, dis the distinction between 2 and 3, between pooling signals and partially informative signals is completely arbitrary. I just, I just made it up. You can call both of them partially informative signals. But in, in this number three, in this example of partially informative signal, we can think of uh, states being very binary. And we can send two messages. So one message would perfectly identify one state. Another message would be sometimes sent in that state and sometimes in the other state. So it would be suggestive of the other state, uh, but not perfectly revealing. So what would be a good example of that? Let's say the state is uh, whether I prepare it for lecture or not, right? Uh, and you ask me the question, did you prepare for lecture? If I did, I can say yes. But then if I did, I can also say maybe. And if I did not, I will definitely say maybe. So in this case, yes is a perfectly revealing signal that I did prepare for lecture. My answer maybe is a partially informative signal. So it will tell you just by Bayes' rule that I will likely, I likely have not prepared for lecture, but you cannot conclude this with certainty because sometimes I do that response even if I did prepare for lecture. So this is an example of partially informative signal. And uh, the, the very trivial thing that you can do is you can send a very uninformative signal. So you can just tell the players nothing. And the way to model this formally is to say that the distribution of messages does not depend in any way on the distribution of states. So uninformative signals mean, means that uh, I can still say different things, but I cannot extract any information about the state from whatever I say. So these are just some examples of, of the experiments that we can run, of the experiments that the designer can run that will send the messages to, to, to players. One important distinction that I will mention now and probably never come back to later is between private persuasion and public persuasion. So since we will mostly be looking at settings with one player, we will not care about this. But if you have many players with which you can talk, then in general, in the way that I presented this experiment, uh, you can maybe able to say different things to different people. And this can sometimes be desirable. So this is what is kind of called private persuasion. I can communicate with every player privately. In some settings, you might be constrained to public persuasion, meaning that you must choose such an experiment and all players will observe the realization of that experiment together. So you cannot tailor messages to, to different players depending on what, what you want them to do. And this is sometimes a very restrictive Restriction on the setting, sometimes not, but this distinction is, is out there. So now let's talk about the timing. Uh, you've already alluded to this, but basically it's very important to realize what the timing is in our model. In particular, the timing is such that the principal must first choose the experiment 
and only then the state will realize or or will be observed by the by the principal by the designer uh, and feed into the experiment so it's very important that the designer does not get to see this realization of the uncertainty of the state while choosing the experiment and then and then send the messages according to this mechanism so this is what's called persuasion problem if you have the other order of operations meaning that first some state is realized then the designer gets to see what the state is and choose what 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 they can tell what they can tell the players then this is not a persuasion problem so this will be a communication problem it will be very different it will be very difficult these are more well known in the, in the literature uh, theorists have been studying them for what 30 40 yeah, probably 40 years at least and uh, those are in general more difficult so one of the reasons why this kind of persuasion literature this information design literature blew up is that it, it is much simpler to solve these problems than these problems and again this slide uh, tells you basically what I just said so yeah the way to interpret this is that like in mechanism design our designer must commit to some experiment because one thing that you can think of is that well I tell you that I will run this experiment run right then I run this experiment I see what it gets us I see what information about state it conveys and maybe then I can say I don't want I don't really want to show this result to to everybody right to to the players or vice versa I I, I maybe want to just tinker with this result a little bit and uh, reveal some of it but not all of it something like that so this commitment assumption and this timing assumption more broadly says that the designer must not be able to do this so there are no decisions to be made after the state has realized the designer must fully commit to this whole communication strategy ex ante so before knowing anything about the state so this promise to report a given thing promise to communicate on a certain thing and not another is basically the weakest part of this whole setup because it's a strange thing to assume in mechanism design the justification for commitment was that we could basically write a contract saying every party should do this thing and then everybody is fine if uh, we do something different if we if the designer for example deviates from the mechanism that is written down in the contract then the designer is punished but we can write these contracts for mechanism design it is difficult to write them for information design it is really difficult to write contracts on communication how do you say that well I can promise to tell you this and not this maybe if we are talking about the particular disclosure dimensions of disclosure for example we can enforce the firm to report uh, given statistics of its earnings so like this dimension of it, the firm's well-being but the firm would not have to report for example I don't know whether its inputs are fair trade and uh, fairly sourced something like that right so if the distinction is between which dimensions of the state then we can maybe write this context but if we are thinking about like partially informative signals like this one where you choose where you mix among different messages in different states then the contract would have to say that the, that the distribution of messages conditional on this state is this but you cannot verify in reality the distribution of somebody's messages if you can only observe their realized message so the bottom line is the commitment assumption in this literature is makes a lot less sense than in mechanism design but we stick with it nonetheless yeah maybe to, to give you a little bit of, of flavor for why communication problems are more difficult is that in communication problems you do not have one problem for the designer but you have many problems right so we can represent it as follows there are let's say different states of the world like three of them in information design you solve one problem for all of them so you choose one big 
experiment which maps from here every state to uh, to some distribution over messages. What we have in communications problem instead, communication problems, is that you have a separate problem for every state. So in this state I must decide what I want to say. In this decide I must decide what I want to say. In this state and so on. And these are kind of separate problems, but the problem is they are linked together. So this is the example here on the slide. Uh, for example, we have two states of the world. So a, a company can have high earnings or low earnings. And we have a CEO, a manager, who can communicate these earnings to the investor or to the general public. So if the earnings are high, the manager wants to say, well, you know, the earnings are actually high. But if uh, the earnings are low, then the manager probably also wants to say that the earnings are high, so as to not create panic among the investors, so as to not upset uh, his employers, the stockholders. So this would mean that this message of high earnings will be completely uninformative, right? because it is sent in both states. So the manager's incentives to report high earnings in low state distort the meaning of this message that the manager would want to imbue this message with uh, in the high earnings state. So now let's finally talk about some examples of information design. So this is this list is from the uh, survey of Kaminitsa, and you can get the exact references to all the all these papers in there. Uh, where can we encounter information design and where can we apply information design in the real world. One example that I briefly mentioned last week as well is financial sector stress tests. So you have central bank, you have commercial banks that might or that may or may not be failing under crisis, so they may or may not have enough liquidity to meet all their obligations and so on. And you want to stress test these banks. You want to see how bad is the, situa is the situation really with those banks. So on the one hand, you want to filter out the bad seeds, the, the uh, failing banks. You want to clear the economy from them. On the other hand, you do not want to provoke the bank runs in the economy, right? Because those can crash pretty much any bank, even if it's good. So you can kind of, you want to design this information in such a way that it would maybe filter out the worst banks, but it would not create any incentives for, uh, for bank runs uh, after other messages. And this is the setting in which the central bank can commit to some testing strategy, so to some experiment over, uh, over the state of the world, where the state of the world is the bank's current condition. Right? The central bank can say, well, we will look at this, this, and this accounting indicators, we will aggregate them according to this kind of rule, and we will reveal results in, 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 this, in this way, according to this scale. So we say the bank is solvent if its score is above this level. The bank, the bank is not solvent if its score is, above, is below that level. And in this setting, it is reasonable to assume that, yeah, the central bank can commit to some testing strategy. Uh, evaluation in schools can be another example. So the teacher can commit to some grading strategy, saying, well, whom do we give a 12, whom do we give a 10, whom do we give a 7, and so on, and whom do we fail? So you can think of many different trade-offs in that, in that setting. On the one hand, you want your students to have good grades, because you want them to be able to uh, get into good college, get good jobs, and so on. So grades matter in some of those. Uh, on the other hand, you want to screen students to some extent. So you want maybe the good students to be, to get better outcomes than worse students. But if you give everyone a 12, then this is not the case. Finally, you might want to give students the incentives to work. So you, you might want to commit to failing some people. And this will kind of create incentives to work, to work for a higher grade. OK, uh, employee feedback, law enforcement deployment, censorship, entertainment, financial OTC markets. <laughs> 
these are some of the possible applications. I realize that I do not talk much about many of them, but you can read uh, this community survey and basically most of it is going through all of these different applications and saying, well, how can we make information design work in all of these different settings? And you can see that most of these were written in the past 10 years, pretty much. So this is a literature that kind of blew up. So as I told you, there are two different approaches to information design. And so far, I've been sticking to this one interpretation of information design, which I'll call the literal interpretation, meaning that we have some designer who designs these experiments and then tells them, uh, tells players about them. This second interpretation is a metaphorical interpretation of information design. And it says that all these same tools can be applied as well for a different purpose. In particular, if we try to apply uh, these models to, to, to analyze the real world. And for example, when we look at some real world interaction out there, we can maybe see what game the agents are playing but we do not know what information they're having, what information they have at their disposal when they're making the decisions. So if we are the outside observers, analysts, and we try to predict what will happen in that setting, then we have to consider all possible information structures. And this is kind of what, what information design does, right? You have a fixed game, but you vary the information structures, and you see how the outcome changes with that with respect to the information structures. So there is no explicit designer, but it's rather the, the analyst trying to make predictions about the, the outcome of a given interaction without having full information. So there is no also maximization here. It's not about selecting the optimal information structure, but it's about considering all the information structures and maybe, I don't know, maybe looking at the worst for, for you. So considering the worst case scenario or the average scenario, something like this. So the first one, the literal interpretation is kind of the Bayesian persuasion by Kamenica. The second one, the metaphorical interpretation is the information design of Bergman and Morris. We will mostly be sticking with the literal interpretation just for simplicity, but we will uh, apply the instruments from this metaphorical interpretation and see how they can be used to to, to get the optimal informational mechanism in our literal interpretation. However, that will likely happen next week. And what we will do today, and probably for the rest of today, maybe we'll go a little bit further, but we will look at an illustrative example. So we will solve one simple problem in excruciating detail and see how would you proceed about solving information design problems what kind of is the what are the big ideas there the big steps in the solution that you will use 